Good afternoon and welcome to the third of our Business Skills Webinar Series of 2020. I'm Michael Levesque, Chief Executive Officer of Resolve Collaboration. Many of us strive every day to achieve excellence in our personal and professional lives, but reaching peak performance can be a tough challenge on your own. Here today to help us understand the new science of peak performance is Dan Collison, Managing Partner with financial education firm Advice to Advisors. Dan is a published author with over 30 years of experience in management and teaching. Dan, thank you for being here today. Huh. I'm looking forward to hearing from you and working on hitting my own peak performance. Perfect. Thank you very much, Michael. I really uh, appreciate being here and I appreciate Resolve actually hosting these webinars on a regular basis and I understand doing it throughout 2020, which I think is a, a fabulous opportunity for your audience and for our audiences to hear all of these different ideas. So. The opportunity for me today is to talk about an area that I love to discuss. I've been researching it and reading the research on it for the last 30 years. Peak performance is an, is an opportunity for anyone to excel at what they want to look to do themselves. So our general agenda is very diverse, yet it really entirely enmeshes and becomes simple because one dovetails into the other. So as we walk through this, we're going to look at an overview of what the positive psychologists call PERMA. This is what we want to look at in the big frame of things and then we'll get very specific with what kind of mindset you need to actually move towards peak performance. Looking at goal setting and what it takes to achieve those goals. We're going to talk about cultivating passion. Everybody talks about passion and there's a lot of science behind it and a lot of it is misinformation that's out there on passion. We're going to talk about how you lead with your character strengths and in fact how you find out what your character strengths are. And then finally we're going to talk about growing grit. How you make sure you can persevere to achieve the goals you're looking to achieve. So let's kick it off with our first element of peak performance. This really comes from the book Flourish by Martin Seligman. Martin Seligman's out of the University of Pennsylvania, basically known as the father of positive psychology. And as I said, this is a big overview because what they call PERMA, the acronym PERMA, is all about how you live with well-being, how you flourish, how you have a good life and in fact a great life. Life. So the P of PERMA is positive emotions and here they discuss and look at the research that says you know how do you stay happy, how do you stay positive beyond just moods but your emotions are on a regular high and not necessarily a crazy high but that you've got a constant happiness about you. And then engagement. Uh, Haley sent me high, Cheek sent me high, looked at flow in his book, Flow talks about being engaged in activities that you actually lose track of time because you are so engaged in them. That's flow. Talk about positive relationships, making sure that you're interacting with the people that you want to interact with or in fact have to and you do that on a positive basis. Everything we do, and especially when we're moving towards peak performance, has to be, have meaning. In other words, we have to believe we're doing good, we're doing things, in fact, for others, and quite often what we're doing is bigger than ourselves and it has impact that goes far beyond ourselves. And finally, looking at what we're going to discuss today, which is achievement, and looking at exactly what it is to take to go from just mere achievement to peak performance. So the big overview, looking at what makes us happy, what gives us well-being, what helps us flourish, and then within all of that, let's take a look at achievement and how we get to peak performance. So our second element, I wanna talk about the growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. And Carol Dweck out of Stanford University has written for decades on this area, and it's a fascinating area to discuss and to look at. And really what, what Dweck talks about is not only the ability to actually keep your mind open and continuously learn and strive to learn, but also that ability to pass on that growth mindset. And really this puts me in mind of teachers or coaches. You know, our job is to help others grow. And if in fact we have a fixed mindset, fixed mindset about a subject or in fact about a person, we can actually knock them down. We can actually limit their growth opportunities. We can help develop fixed mindsets 
in children in those individuals that we teach, that we coach. And in fact, the suggestion is this growth mindset or fixed mindset actually starts very early in childhood and really can be impacted by parents from almost birth. So the idea is that we constantly look to grow our mindsets and have a growth mindset itself. And when we break this down, we look at a number of areas. And first of all, looking at growth mindset from nurturing your self-efficacy means that we actually believe we have the ability, the capacity, the capabilities to grow, that we want to grow, that we know what we want to grow towards, and that we believe in ourselves. And again, when teaching or coaching, that we believe in others, that they have the capability to learn and to grow. We look at failure as not failure in itself, but an opportunity to continue to grow. And we're not afraid of failure. We, we understand that it has to happen at different times. We don't seek it out necessarily, but failure will happen. How do we rectify that and how do we learn and grow from that? Cultivating self-awareness is part of the whole thought on emotional intelligence, what we talk about emotional quotient. And in this area, we, we really see the value of emotional intelligence. And in fact, we can compare it to IQ. When we compare emotional quotient to uh, I, IQs, your intelligence quotient, we see a number of different things that, that actually can benefit from us studying emotional intelligence. Uh, simply that too much weight is very often put on IQ, you know, that that technical, that logical thought process. Uh, and a lot of individuals might believe that IQ is what drives peak performance, but it is only one factor. And in fact, we, we've seen in research that IQ doesn't give you a lot of direction on, on how far you're able to go. You know, if we look at Mensa, where we have those above IQ individuals, and when we rank Mensa, their, their bottom line is a, a 130 on the IQ testing, you know, where the average is about 85 to 115. Mensa members don't necessarily hit peak performance. In fact, what the research has shown is a great percentage of them never achieve any greatness. They don't go beyond the average life, the average capabilities or growth. And in fact, we can look to emotional intelligence uh, as a way of actually helping propel us towards peak performance. Yes, IQ matters, but EQ, emotional intelligence, also matters. Understanding ourselves and also understanding how we interact with others is paramount. I love the idea of being curious. This has everything to do with why, asking the questions of why. And those that are really heading towards peak performance ask why about everything they're interested in. But beyond just why, just asking why, they seek out the why. So they're always looking for the answers. They look for challenges. It, it's not that challenge is a barrier, but they understand that challenges have to be overcome. So they're looking to understand where the challenges could be and they're pre-planning what they can do to overcome challenges. And they're also ready when those unexpected challenges come to bear. The idea of doing what you love is paramount in so many different aspects of psychology. And I think probably one of the areas that is let down the millennials and young people of today is we're constantly telling our youth to search out their passions, find out what it is they love, and that's very often sending young people down a pathway that they, they have no way of, of actually understanding where they're going. The reality is we can actually learn to love something if we focus on it. It's not just that a passion is out there and it's to be found, it's learning how to find and create that passion. Uh, obviously, you've gotta be tenacious, you've gotta have grit, which we're going to be talking about to achieve peak performance. And it's how do we do that? How do we learn to be gritty? And we're gonna talk about Angela Duckworth who has focused her research on that area. And then inspire and be inspired. And this really has everything to do with hope, positivity, with optimism. Understanding that we can overcome pessimism and in fact we can learn to be optimistic. And this is one of the key elements in having that growth mindset and especially if we're actually teaching or coaching other individuals without hope, without the ability to spawn that inspiration, we've got little chance of helping others grow their own growth mindset. 
Our third element of peak performance really comes down to what Stephen Covey listed as his second habits in his book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. When he said begin with the end in mind, it had everything to do with goal setting, looking at what it is we want to achieve and then working backwards from that. And in fact, the science shows that what we want to do is we want to go out into the future to where we want our goals to be achieved and then start breaking down into bite-sized portions, smaller goals, areas that we can attain on a regular basis to actually get to that final goal, that final destination. So when Covey talked about the, the ability to begin with the end in mind, he says there's two aspects of beginning with the end in mind. In fact, the first is visualization. You know, we know that athletes, and this is well researched, athletes tend to visualize every aspect of whatever sport they're in, of what they're going to be participating in, of what they've got to do. And what the research has also shown on many occasions, that visualization will actually take their heart rate and a lot of different aspects of their physiology up to a level that they would actually be feeling in the activity itself. So it's visualizing where you want to be, what it feels like, what it looks like, and getting a good grasp on what it's like to be at that winning point, at that goal achievement. Once we've visualized it, then as Covey says, you've got to take action. Because as good as visualization is, much like Nike says, just do it. If you don't take that visualize, that visualization and really allow the rubber to hit the road, nothing happens. So these two aspects begin with the end of mind, literally means visualization in the mind and then take action. Our fourth element of passion is a newer area of study and there's a lot of research into it and there's a lot of interesting research that goes with it. But if we go to Amy Rosinski who teaches uh, at Yale, in fact, in the, the School of Management at Yale, she uses a, a short parable and she, she studies the work environment and how people interact with work and what they get from the workplace. And the parable, I'm sure many of you have heard this before, but it starts with an, a man walking past a construction site and he's looking at, at this scene and he wanders upon a worker and he bends down and he asks the worker what he's doing and the worker barely looks up and just mouths, you know, I'm laying bricks. And our man says, oh, okay, that's interesting. And he moves on and he wanders through the construction site. And he comes across a, another worker and he says, oh, what are you doing? And the second worker says, I'm building a church. He says, oh, interesting, very good, thank you very much. And our man continues on his journey, walking around the construction site. He sees another worker and he moves up towards him and he taps him on the shoulder. The man looks up to him and he says, what are you doing? And the worker looks up to him with a beaming smile and says, I'm building the house of God. And to Rosniewski, this is a parable that actually parallels the workplace. And in fact, in her research, she's shown that these three different episodes are exactly how people are placed in workplaces, how they place themselves. The first, I'm laying bricks, is someone with a job that they're there to get paid and that's all they're doing. The second, I'm building a church, really leads to someone who's looking for a career they are on a stepping stone, as it were, and they're looking to achieve the next best thing in their job, in their career. And then finally, I'm building the house of God, is someone with a calling, someone who has passion for what they do. They understand that this is bigger than themselves, that there's meaning in what they do, and they're living their passion. And what Rosniewski has found is that about 33% of each of these categories falls into every single job, whether it's a janitor, you know, there's 
about a third of those janitors that are just doing it for the paycheck. There's about a third that are actually looking to move up and outwards. Maybe they want to be the supervisors of, of janitors. And then finally, there's the calling, those janitors who believe what they're doing has real meaning. They believe that they're cleaning to benefit others. You know, a janitor in a school is helping children. A janitor in a hospital is helping keep the place clean and safe for the patients and for the doctors to work and thrive in. Uh, so when we look at these three categories, we look, okay, what does this mean to us in peak performance? Well, obviously, if we can move from that job through that career really to that calling, this is where we find those individuals that actually hit peak performance. Now when we talk about that passion that leads to that calling, Robert Valorand, who is a professor out of the University of Quebec in Montreal, has written extensively and studied and researched the area of passion for the last several decades, and he looks at seven characteristics of passion. First he says it's oriented towards a specific entity or activity. So we're all very well aware of world-class athletes, those individuals that, that are stellar, that hit the top of the ranks every time. This is their focus. And again, there we also can go to the average individual who seems average, but that teacher who actually totally brings the children, brings the students along with them. They help them drive up their passion for learning as much as that teacher's passion for educating is. So we've got every aspect, every opportunity to use passion and to get to that calling around a specific activity. And it's really a love versus just a pleasure of the activity. People that are moving towards peak performance or are already in peak performance love what they do. It's not just, okay, I'm going to do this, it's pleasurable. It's truly a love and they look forward to it and they're constantly looking at how do I get more of this. Again, meaning, and meaning is so ripe in peak performance. It's the belief that this has real value for the individual themselves, but also for others. It's bigger than themselves and they see themselves helping something much larger to come to fruition. Passion itself is motivational, so it tends to drive people to continue working towards the next level of achievement. And you, you think of so many athletes, musicians, uh, chess champions, all that have this passion to keep getting bigger. I, I think of somebody like uh, a Michael Phelps. You know, Michael Phelps, the swimmer, won over 20, well, actually won 28 Olympic medals, 25 of those gold. He had a passion for swimming. Uh, another thing that he had, which was unlike the average individual, but fairly typical for high-end, world-class swimmers, his body had all the proportions. He had the physiology of almost the perfect swimmer. He was tall at six foot four, but what was unusual is that his torso was much longer than the average six foot four torso would be. And in fact, his torso was as, as long as somebody that would actually be six foot eight. Uh, his legs were actually short for his torso. Virtually all of his joints, he was double jointed, uh, both in the elbows, the ankles, and even in the hands, so that in the way he was able to move through the water, his hands and their feet acted like flippers. So as I said, a lot of world-class swimmers have this physiology. It's not the norm of the regular populace, but the world-class swimmers tend to, to be like this. But what Michael had was passion. In fact, he was competing against a lot of people that, that had the same physiology, but his passion drove him to be the best swimmer of the time. It allowed him to achieve those 25 gold Olympic medals. What we find is that this passion leads to persistent, energetic engagement, this constant striving to do better. And this really is what Anders Ericsson uh, researched over the years and in his most recent book, Peak, he talks about this 10,000 hours of practice, this constant practicing to get better, and a very focused practice, a deliberate practice as he calls it, so that you're always doing something to refine and get better. And it's those individuals that 
have peak performance or are moving towards peak performance. They focus on practice. They continue to do it. And what Anders Ericsson has said is, yes, it takes 10,000 to be world class, the best of the best, but it doesn't take 10,000 to be great. You can have 8,000 hours of practice in whatever endeavor, whether it's playing a guitar, whether it is learning chess, whether it's trying to be a great swimmer, whatever it is, it doesn't take the full 10,000 unless you're looking to be absolute world class. But the average individual can continuously get better by using deliberate practice, by focusing on what they need to do and consistently getting better. And within this deliberate practice is an optimism that you don't see in the average individual because when they come up against hurdles, whether it's didn't swim as fast as I anticipated, so I'm going to do more laps. What they've actually found are these individuals that go for true peak performance, even when they get hit with negativity, whether they get hit with not doing as well as they anticipated, their next attempt is even better and they get back on track and they're able to spurn themselves to doing bigger and better things. What we do know about passion is it becomes part of your identity. You know, whether you're a financial advisor, whether you're a teacher, whether you're an athlete, whatever it is, people know you as that because that's how you self-identify. You believe in what you do so much, you talk about it, you show it, you live that passion, and it's part of your identity. However, as Valeron mentions and has written about and researched considerably, passion can go one of either way. It could be a great passion or it can be a negative passion. And as we all know, we, we've got teachers that just gone the wrong route and they're, they're actually bringing down their students. We've got financial advisors that end up in jail because the passion to, to actually make more money has led them astray. So we've got this duality that demands we understand is this a good passion or is this a bad passion. The focus on a good passion that not only helps the self but helps other and again is bigger than ourselves but positive for the individual possibly for society in itself can help keep us on track. The fifth area that I want to look at, strengths. Uh, a lot has been written about and a lot has been researched on strengths, but there's some very specific areas that we can look at. And psychology in itself has, for the most part, been focused on the negatives, on the ills, on ill health. What makes us sick? In their diagnostics and statistical manual, it lists all the different sicknesses that can be measured and that a psychologist, a psychiatrist, a therapist can work with to help make better. However, in the last 20 plus years, we've had a new movement in the, the world of psychology, positive psychology, that actually looks at what makes life good. What is it that makes us happy? And in fact, there had been a lot written over the millennium, in fact, that what makes us happy. But the real research has begun over the last 20, 30 years. And in fact, positive psychology has grown into an actual part of psychology. Uh, you can get degrees in positive psychology now. But what they're looking at is what are the strengths? What is it that makes life worth living versus what are the illnesses and how can we be less ill? And in fact, if you look at strengths and you utilize strengths on a regular basis, the research says that you tend to be happier and you tend to do better. And these strengths, although most of us understand we have certain strengths, when we actually get to the science and look at what our strengths are, and they can be measured, and if we can use those strengths to advance whatever activity we're looking to achieve, then we'll do better than just trying to, to do it fly by night, as it were. We've actually created uh, a strengths journal that we use with our clients. And if you go to our website, you can see it and, and get it there. But it's, it's actually inputting your top five character strengths, understanding what those strengths are and how you use them. And in fact, when you would use them at different times of your life at different times of your work and in fact the one area that we see and it's again well researched is 
This can be used for children, and in fact, a lot of parents do this without actually realizing the value of what they're doing, and it comes under the what went well scenario. You know, a lot of parents will ask at the dinner table or even at bedtime, you know, the young child, what went well? And what they're trying to do is elicit you know, positive aspects of a child's day. And what the research says is that a child will sleep better, they'll wake up happier, and in fact, they will become more positive, will drive up optimism in this children. Well, what the research also says is this is very doable for adults as well. So the idea here is to lead with your strengths. And what Seligman found when they did this research, and it took them several years to build out their positive psychology and their character strengths and virtues, what they found was that there were about 24 specific strengths under these virtues that they studied, that they were very persistent in looking at that crossed all cultures. So when we look at these virtues and look at the character strengths within these virtues, temperance, courage, justice, humanity, transcendence, and wisdom, Again, these transcend virtually all cultures, and that's what they were looking to do, much like the DSM, much like what makes individuals ill, this is what makes individuals happy and strong. And what we see with these, again, using them to lead with our activities has so many benefits. And again, for the most part, people have some understanding of where their strengths are, but you can actually go on to the website at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, the website is www.authentichappiness, one word, .org, and go through an exercise. It takes about 45 minutes. You're going to answer over 100 questions about you. And what it'll do, it'll categorize and itemize, basically, your 24 strengths. And then the idea here is to focus on what are your top five character strengths? What can you actually use to work with? And when we're coaching our clients, we're, we're looking at these top five and saying, okay, how do you use them? And very specifically, when do you use them? Because in reality, there are times where we want to use one strength over another. If we're standing in front of an audience, one strength could be very positive, uh, whereas we could use a different strength when we're face to face with an individual, when it's trying times, when we're facing challenges, it could be certainly a different strength that we're going to pull on. What we've found is that by understanding and really knowing those top five character strengths, as people start to work and really understand them, and if they use the journal to constantly look at what they've been doing, what made things go well, they can actually start to prescribe and look forward into the future and say, okay, this is where I'm going to use this strength. And it really doesn't matter what your strengths are. Everybody's slightly different, obviously. Everybody's got their top five. The one area that I would say is very important to teachers, to coaches, to anyone that's looking for peak performance comes under transcendence, and it comes under hope. This is optimism. And if you're not an optimistic individual, it's very difficult to actually ever get towards a peak performance. And in fact, the likelihood, if you are pessimistic, you're not even striving towards any element of peak performance. What we do know through the research, and again through Martin Seligman himself, he did a lot of years of research on optimism, wrote a book called Learned Optimism, and he's shown that it's a very learnable strength. And in fact, all of these strengths can move, they can change order throughout your lives. And if you focus on one and want to be great in it and you want to bring it up into your top five strengths for whatever reason, it is doable. And in fact, with our coaching clients, those that are looking to achieve peak performance, if hope doesn't actually fit into their top five, if it's somewhere below, we will focus on that optimism. We will make sure that this is a constant area of attention. Uh, all you have to think of is the financial advisor that is pessimistic. What we see is that is not the individual that's going to, first of all, attract a lot of people. What they tend to attract is pessimists themselves. And the reality is you've got pessimists working with pessimists, not an overly pleasurable lifestyle to get into, certainly not a pleasurable 
profession to be in, yet we do find it in every profession, unfortunately, but it is something that can be changed. Hope, optimism is something that can be learned, and it's something we certainly coach towards when it's necessary to do so. Final area, number six in our peak performance elements is grit. And grit, as Angela Duckworth has noted, is passion and perseverance for long-term goals. In fact, Angela Duckworth wrote just a few years ago the book Grit. Uh, it came from the research that she's been doing at the University of Pennsylvania for many years. And Duckworth actually started out, she was in management consultant, she got into education, became a teacher after the consultancy work, and she started to believe things other than what was the general rule of thumb. And in other words, she started to question why certain students did so much poorer than good students and why, in fact, those good students did so well. And she almost became a pariah in her belief and what her research ultimately led to. And unlike the vast majority of individuals who blame the teachers or blame the school boards, blame the government, whoever it is, Angela actually looked and said, okay, what if it's actually the students themselves? What if the students are the ones that set them up for failure or success? And she looked at that, she did her, her graduate work, and once in with her PhD and once working at University of Pennsylvania, she got heavily into the area of grit, the passion and perseverance, because that's what she found that those very top end students head. They possess the passion and perseverance for their long-term goals. They themselves helped propel themselves towards peak performance within their own classes. So when we look at what Duckworth sees as peak performance and in fact what drives peak performance, grit, the ugly truth is exactly this. She found that, you know, everybody focuses on talent and talent in itself, so someone like a, a Michael Phelps, again, the swimmer, he was built to swim physically. So he had a certain talent that a lot of us, certainly myself, not built to swim. But he had that talent, learning to swim, but then he put in the effort, the necessary effort, to turn it into a skill. And as a child, he took that swimming capability, his physiology, put a lot of effort into it, turned himself into a good swimmer. However, once a good swimmer, and based on his drive, his personal drive to be great and really to be the best in, in his sport, he took that skill that he had not only learned but put effort into, he took the skill and put effort into it again and drove that effort hard to actually get to achievement, to get where he ranked as top in the world. So as Duckworth says, effort counts twice. So yes, there are a lot of individuals who have talents in all aspects. There's certain people who are built, musicians as it were, physiology, their mindset, they might be able to hear better, they've got better dexterity in their fingers, whatever it is, they've got an innate talent that they can use, but they have to put effort in to turn it into a skill. And those that actually have that mindset, and we're always talking about a growth mindset, they believe they can go beyond the average and they take that skill and again they apply more effort to it they put more practice in and again we come back to Anders Ericsson deliberate practice they put sufficient focused deliberate practice into being so that they achieve what they're looking to achieve so effort counts twice as Duckworth suggests and I would suggest to anyone that has children if you don't have this book grit get the book because as Duckworth shows grit is learnable if grit is at the heart of driving peak performance right we can actually help individuals whether they're children or adults we can help them become gritty because certainly what the research shows is not everyone is gritty in fact they've got tests at University of Pennsylvania they've got tests on grit they've got a grit scale that you can actually measure your grit 
And on a scale of one to five, five being the absolute grittiest, those that do hit their peak performance, versus a one, someone who's afraid of their own shadow, someone who's never likely to move towards any kind of true performance, this is learnable. So just starting off from actually looking at your grit scale and saying, what is it I need to do to achieve? And then as Duckworth says, and is, is written in her book, there's a number of things that we can look at. First of all, interest. And again, this is where we start to mesh a lot of this research. You know, you can't hit peak performance if you're not interested in what you're doing, if you're not interested in your sport, in your music, in your profession. You have to have an interest. And when we talk about passion, again, you know, we're constantly telling young people, go out and find your passion. It would probably be a lot better if we actually said, develop your passion. What Duckworth's research has shown is find out what you're interested in. And if you're interested in it, put focus on it. And when you put focus on it, start to put deliberate practice towards it. Because as you become better at something you're interested, you work towards expertise. And that expertise in itself can start to flame a certain passion. And that passion is going to be absolutely necessary, as she says, with passion and perseverance, to hit that peak performance. So it's not, let's go and find a passion, but let's find an interest, and let's go deep into that interest. So any profession, we can just get deeper and deeper. And when you think of graduate students, that's exactly what they're doing when they're doing their PhD. They're going very deep into an area of research that very few have ever gone into, and they keep going deeper and they become the experts and it's what they become known for ultimately. Purpose, again, and as we've seen in a number of areas of research, purpose has huge significance. So we have to believe that what we have a passion for has purpose. It's got purpose for ourselves, but it also has purpose for others. It has meaning, and if we go back to Seligman's PERMA, that meaning. We find value in doing it, we find value for ourselves, but we also believe that the purpose of what we're doing has impact on others, and in fact, it becomes bigger than ourselves. And again, back to practice, back to Anders Ericsson, all the practice that this will take just makes us better. We take our interest, we turn it into a passion. The passion is spawned by not just the interest, but the purpose and the belief that we're doing something bigger than ourselves. And that drives that, that desire for practice, that deliberate practice that is demanded to actually hit peak performance. And then back to the optimism, right? Tally Sherrod, uh, out of uh, University College in London, wrote a book, uh, The Optimism Bias, and she talks about optimism and the value that it brings. And we're not talking about this wide-eyed, over-the-top optimism, but just a belief that things can get better. And in fact, they can get better because we believe we can make them better. So optimism relies on us believing that we actually make a difference in what happens to us. The pessimist believes that bad things happen and we don't have any way of overcoming those, or at least the way to overcome that pessimistic uh, situation is just too much work, it's too hard to achieve, and they just let negative things happen. Whereas the optimistic person doesn't get stumped by negative situations. They say, I can overcome this. This isn't necessarily my fault. Uh, it could be others' faults, but I'll rectify it and I won't let it stand in my way. So that hope has a huge part in everything that we look at and it always shows up in the areas of peak performance. They've got that optimism and again back to Martin Seligman and his book Learned Optimism. It can be learned. We can go from a pessimistic individual to an optimistic if we put a focus on it and we actually understand where we're trying to get and we understand that we are actually the authors of our own optimism. But remember, as great as peak performance is, as good as it is to become world class, or at least to surpass what we've done in the past, we've got to put it into perspective because there are innumerable stories. Everybody knows the musicians, the entertainers, the athletes 
that had great achievement. They had fantastic peak performance. They were at the top of their games and for whatever reason they derailed, right? Drugs, alcohol, just wild lifestyles, dangerous lifestyles. You know, when we look to create this situation of peak performance, of achievement, we have to look at it in the confines of how do we actually do this within a lifestyle that will allow us to flourish? How do we ensure that peak performance doesn't take us to a level that we're actually derailing every other aspect of our lives? So again, we go back to the, the whole concept of positive psychology to Martin Seligman's flourish. We've got to say, okay, within this whole concept of flourishing, we've got to make sure that we've got our positive mo emotions in check, that we're looking at our moods and we're not actually mistaking them for our emotions. We're looking at our long-term emotions and we're constantly looking to achieve that optimism, that what Talia Sherrick calls that moderate realistic optimism versus a pessimistic outlook. We've got to make sure that we're on the right path with our emotions. We've got to make sure that whatever and whenever possible, we're engaging in things that we love to do and that we get that opportunity to go into flow so that time passes without us even knowing. We're enjoying to a level that doesn't happen all the time, but we're so deep, we're so ensconced, we're so engaged with what we're doing that time flows. Our relationships are healthy relationships and even better, the relationships that help us towards our peak performance and in turn we help others achieve great performance. Then that we've got meaning in our lives, that it's not all about us and in fact it's not just our tiny inner circle, we're trying to do things that are bigger than us, they mean more than just us. And then when we bring achievement and ultimately peak performance into this area, this PERMA, we're able to flourish and we're able to actually take advantage and live the life that we would like to live while achieving such greatness. So what's the return on investment? If we're going to put all this effort, or at least what seems like a great deal of effort, what's the return on investment? Well, it's a great life. It's a flourishing life. It's a level of happiness that keeps us from falling into despair, into depression, and in fact, what the science shows is if we can work with PERMA and we can work with achievement at a consistent basis, that this can actually help bring individuals who are in depression out of depression and into a positive state. And it can do it very often more than the drugs can do it for us. Uh, it's been proven that quite often depression can be lifted purely by focusing in on leading a better, a happier, a more meaningful life through PERMA, through achievement, than is the typical. And what we want to see is we want to see individuals getting to the point where it's always thank God it's Monday versus thank God it's Friday. Uh, it reminds me, I was driving down the highway on my way to work one day, and this is about 10 years ago, and the DJ on the radio said it's hump day. Now, it was Wednesday, and I'm sure you're all familiar with the concept of hump day. We're halfway through the week. We're almost to the weekend. And it just got me thinking, what a miserable existence for anyone to think that hump day is a good attitude. And in fact, what, what that's suggesting, and what, thank God, it's Friday is suggesting, is that we're trying to plow through five days of the week five working days that supposedly we don't enjoy to get to those two days, Saturday and Sunday, to get to our weekend so that we actually get to benefit from two-sevenths of the week. What a miserable existence that would be if we actually fell into the trap of buying into, thank God it's Friday, you know, it's hump day, the week's halfway over. You know, how good would it be if you woke up every day and said, thank God it's Monday, thank God it's Tuesday, thank God it's Wednesday. That's what peak performers do. They look forward to every day because every day is an opportunity to strive for the next level. It's a day that they can actually say, this is what I've done, how do I do better? Or this is what I've learned, 
How do I learn more? How do I keep that growth mindset going? How do I help myself and how do I help others? So as the very old saying goes, and I'm sure you've all heard it, you know, it's not the destination, it's the journey that makes life great. So I wish you all a great journey. Peak performance will make that journey that much more enjoyable and I, I wish it for you all. Thanks very much for tuning in and I'll turn it back to you, Michael. Thanks so much, Dan, that's really interesting. And I find something you talk about enjoying every day of the week. And, and I find that, you know, as a business owner and an entrepreneur, I enjoy them in different ways. And it's like, yes, it's Monday, I've, I've got this I want to accomplish, I've got this opportunity I'm excited about. And then you wake up and you're like, oh good, it's only Wednesday, because I've still got time to get this project done, I've still got that to get. And then you start to get to that weekend mode and you're like, oh yeah, you know what? Now it's the weekend. Now it's some time for me, some time for family, some time to swift mode, but enjoying every day of the week. Every day. Absolutely. Terrific. That's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, if people want to learn more about uh, your coaching or advising, or how do they get in touch with you? Oh, sure. Thanks. Uh, you can just go to our website, www.advice2advisors.com, or feel free to email me at daniel.collison at advice2advisors.ca. So, Great. Pleasure, Michael. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. As a reminder, this was our third webinar. We'll be back again in April with our fourth edition, and I hope that you can join us then. Thank you.